So my name's Jeannie Bean, and this is the Milwaukee Theosophical Society on April 4th, and um, the talk tonight is the Book of Enoch. And I do want to acknowledge that it's also the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King's assassination, and we do remember. Um, so the Book of Enoch is a controversial text that um, w was from the Book of the Bible, the Book of the Bible, and um, it's known for having been before Moses and content that is controversial. And as Kathleen said, we like yeah, controversy or that's not bad. Um, some of the main ideas, um, um, or it's divided into several books, it's 108 chapters. The written content is from 200 BCE, and so there's five books, and um, one of the, the first one is called the Book of the Watchers, the Book of the Parables, the Astronomical Book, the Book of Dream Visions, and the Epistle of Enoch. So we're going to look at this and, and look at the controversy of it. Some of it, I'm going to talk about the the, the text and the history of that as well. But some of the key themes we'll be, we'll be looking at are Apocrypha, Angels, Ascension, a little bit about Aliens, and even Antarctica. And as you know, last year I did a, a talk on Antarctica, and that sort of opened up my inquiry into the Book of Enoch, and hopefully by the end I can explain that connection. So, um, they're in... Apocrypha are texts, biblical texts, that are considered accepted in some traditions and not in others. And so the Book of Enoch is um, considered apocryphal. And there are references to it in... Did I lose a slide? Uh, perhaps that's okay. That are in the, um, old, in, the, in the Old Testament. One of them is in Genesis. Um, Enoch walked with God. Um, one in Hebrews, by faith Enoch was taken up so that he did not see death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended and one who pleased God. So he pleased God. And, and the third reference is in Jude, which is um, a New Testament. And the Lord, um, Enoch, the seventh descendant of Adam, long ago pro prophesied the, lo the Lord will come with many thousands of his holy angels. So those are actually some key ideas that Enoch ascended. He's one of uh, three great biblical figures, Jesus, Ezekiel, and uh, rather Elijah, and Enoch who actually ascended. And then the calling of the, the final days, the ancient of days. So some of the topics uh, we're going to look at our sacred text, canon, and lost text, the, the story of the creation, the fallen angels, and the ten heavens, a bit about Enoch's life, um, and then a closer look at the saga of the fallen angels, um, how we are recovering lost text today in the 20 and the 21st century, some Enochian themes, and then a bit on cuneiform text. And so we'll go forward with it. Jumping into that, and just a note on sacred texts, they tend to cover a couple key ideas, creation, God, law, history and genealogy, philosophy and esoterics, and even science and technology, and, and Book of Enoch is, has quite a bit of all of that. Um, so looking at the Western sacred text, um, the Mesoric, the Tanaka, the Torah, the Talmud, the Haggadah, which is uh, the oral teachings, the Mishnah, which is the oldest part of the Talmud, and then we come to the, the Christian um, books, the Septuagint, which is 70 books that were translated into Latin under, Ta I mean rather Greek under Ptolemy, the Pharaoh, um, then the Vulgate, which was in the fourth century, and that was the translation of Hebrew text into Latin, and then um, the King James Bible in the 1600s, 16th century, was translated into English. And we have the New Jerusalem Bible today. 
and other text in this tradition would be the Quran, which was written in 600 East, um, AD, and then another um, text from the, uh, Islam called Stories of the Prophets, and then the Dead Sea Scrolls and Kabbalah text. So that's just a quick rundown. You're almost getting blocking Oh, is it? Yeah. You can just maybe move over to the to Okay, your... how's that? That's yeah. well just watch the That's good, yeah. Okay. Um, in terms of Kabbalah text, and Richard, you might know some of these better than many of us. There's the Sefer Yetzirah, which is the book of formation. And um, the Sefer Haba here, which is the Book of Brightness, and this text is kind of controversial because it's believed that the Templars, uh, in their quest to the Holy Land, found this and brought it back to Spain, and, and, and from there it began to influence Western thinking. And then there's uh, the Zohar, the Book of Splendor or Radiance, which is a foundational Kabbalah work. Another one called Ash Mesorah, which is a, a alchemy. Um, called Purifying Fire, and um, the list continues certainly with um, Lully and on down into the modern age. The Maze of Solomon and the Labyrinth Chart are also considered a Kabbalah text. Can you see okay? No, no. <laughs> Would you want to maybe find a different spot? <laughs> the, I'll, yeah, because over here yeah. could work. Okay. So I'd rather you have you... light in your face. Huh? Yeah. And I just want to turn off the lights. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. I just can't see yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. And there's a lot of, there is a lot of content. So um, going forward, the Septuagint is uh, a translation of the Torah from Hebrew to Greek. And that was, again, from Ptolemy. And, and it means 7D. Perhaps you've heard these things and wondered what did they mean. And so there were 17... 70 holy men were brought into separate rooms and said, translate this text into Greek. And so that's where the Septuagint emerged. Um, in terms of the basics of canon, and, and um, that means official biblical text, and there's this term apocrypha, which comes from the Greek hidden. And the Book of Enoch is considered apocryphal. And there's another category called pseudo-epigrapha, which are books that have been known to have been in the Bible but have not been considered either apocryphal or canon, and are sort of out there. Um, the Book of Thomas from the Dead Sea Scrolls is an example, and there's, there's quite a few. Um, but anyway, just to get an idea of where the Book of Enoch fits in. At one time, it was part of the official Bible, and um, then it, it was removed, and so it's considered Apocrypha, though, because in the um, the Bible of the Ethiopians, it was it was intact and it, um, it was found in when in the 1600s intact, and, and we'll t we'll say a little bit more about that. Um, but it's also related to a whole array of other texts that um, have names that maybe you've heard um, in passing starting with Barak, um, Ezra, um, Man Manasseh, Maccabees, the Book of Jubilee, and those are some of the key names in Barnabas. And um, many of these are all surrounding the same group of stories having to do with the first book of the Bible, Genesis, and the fallen angels and the flood. But many of these have different spins and more information. So in the Book of Enoch is considered the most legitimate of all these, but these other books also reference say, similar content. And in the in the um, in those those are in the Old Testament or in the Hebrew tradition, and these books are in the um, in New Testament. So there's again Ezra, Tobit, Judith, um, parts of Esther. A book called The Wisdom of Solomon, another one, Ecclesiasticus, uh, The Story of Susanna, The Idol of History of Bel and the Dragon, The Prayer of Manassas, and then Maccabees. So um, this is a picture from a, um, an Old Testament Bible 
in the time of um, Queen Elizabeth I. And again, all of this is just to give you some perspective. And all of these fall into this group called lost Bible text or lost text. And in the last 50 years, a new approach has been emerging of, of going back to these texts. And um, changing our view of the Old Testament. Um, I did one of the last screen had uh, something about the wisdom of Solomon, which is a book that that had some questionable concept, questionable morality, like um, kind of like a rock and roll song or, or Svengali, enjoy life while we live, no man returns from death, and the strong overcome. So, so some of these books may have been removed for, for other reasons besides having giants and, and such in them. Um, within common, within modern literature, there's a growing interest in this, and, and some fairly significant people have commented on this business of the lost text. Uh, for instance, um, Milik Yazov, who translated the Aramaic version of Enoch, said, Enoch was not included in either the Hebrew or Christian Bible, but could have been considered a sacred text. Um, the Book of Enoch is known from two sets of versions, an Ethiop Ethiopic one and a Slavonic version. Um, the Book of the Secrets of Enoch, after Adam did not die because at age 60, 365 he walked with God and was taken heavenward to join the deity. So so that concept is, is well known. And so going forward, some of the sources of Enoch, as mentioned, are from Ethiopia. And the most intact versions were found. And um, it was James Bruce who is part of the Scottish family you know, associated with the Templars and, and the Masons brought it back from Europe and uh, it took another 200 years for it to get translated. Um, in, in the Ethiopian Bible it is in a language that's called Gees and um, so that was one of the first versions that was brought back into Western culture and, and even through um, the Dark Ages or the, the, the medieval period, there were references, people talked about the Book of Enoch, but it was lost. And, and so then James Bruce finding in, in Ethiopia was very significant. And Ethiopia was a center of great learning. In, um, it's on the coast of the Mediterranean in North Africa. The, at one point, the library um, of Ethiopia was, one, it was not as large as, say, Alexandria, but it was highly respected. And so there was a great tradition of scribes in, in writing this text. Um, going on to the next screen, Sir Walter Raleigh um, in 1616 in his book, The History of the World, he, he talks about the Book of Shiva, I mean the Book of Ethiopia, <laughs> Enoch from Ethiopia. Um, he said, it contained the course of the stars, their names and motions, and had been discovered in Shiva in the first century and was available to Oregon and Tertullian. Um, so they knew about it, but they just didn't know where it was anymore. Um, and then again, it was in the 1600s when it started to be discovered. And finally printed in, in 1773. And very quickly, other sources began to occur. So. The next screen is a history of some of the translations. So in 1821, Richard Lawrence um, had some very first rudimentary copies, the Bruce copies. In 1838, more uh, were developed. In 1893, uh, Robert Henry Charles, and he had 10 additional manuscripts. Charles is considered one of the definitive trans translations, and that takes us to the beginning of the 20th century. And then um, in 1940s, the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, and more of the same text was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So there was a source from Ethiopia, which was known to be legitimate, and then in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so there were new translations in the 50s. 
that came out and then um, a, a very comprehensive one in the 70s kind of cross-referencing the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Ethiopian and the, Slav, the Slavic versions. So, so one of the things that definitely is important about this text is that it's only now in the 20th century that we can start to get a good idea of what it was. It had been lost through the Dark Ages. It had been lost almost a thousand years in usage. Um, and then some other texts that have similar histories and similar content are the Book of Enoch the Prophet, um, the Book of Jubilee, um, the Book of Jasher, the Book of the Giants, and the Epic of Gilgamesh, Enoch and the Watchers, and the Tales of the Patriarchs. And so now that I've given you all this history, so what, what do these books have to tell us? <laughs> what, you know, what, what are they about? Um, I do want to throw this screen up at you. This is um, a recent news article from 2016 about um, the Dead Sea Scroll Library uh, being able to now get translations of texts that were formerly so damaged and so critical that they couldn't even be handled, but they're able to, with this new high, high technology, radar able to read through the, the contents right, I saw and, that. Mm -hmm. and, and get and, and find out what's there mm -hmm. and and I know the Mormons have been deeply involved in financing some of this as well so so again we're in an era when more of these for, forbidden and lost texts are now coming to <coughs> light um, finally um, there's a huge relationship between the text of Enoch and the cuneiform um, tablets and the cuneiform tablets have a similar history where archaeology began to go to these sites King Darius, King Sargon, Cyprus and Babylon and, and Sumeria and Utrecht and Nippur and Ur and, um, and finding um, these incredible uh, places and, and this incredible stonework and you know that's where the, the original written in stone came from and only now are we in the 20th century in the 21st century getting good translations but so this is a list of libraries so um sargon uh of the 24th century bce so so that's how many thousands four thousand years ago five thousand years ago and um, he was the king of Akkad and the cities of Kish, or the city of Uruk. And um, there's a major library of 30,000 uh, cuneiform tablets, and they're dispersed in various places. Um, some of the, the content, some of the um, stories, the books, um, the Epic of Atra Hasis, and the Hammurabi Code, the Epic of Gilgamesh, um, which is a story that is very parallel to the Great Flood. Uh, we'll talk about it. The Enuma Lish, and the Anu, Enuma, Anu, and Lil, which is in the days of Anu and Elil, which are the names of God kings. These are from the 16th century BCE. The Numa Lish is from the 18th century. Another important document that has just been getting translated is the Sumerian King List. Another library is the Library of Nineveh, Barossa, um, and then various inscriptions, which are giant carvings in the um, rock faces of various areas in, that, in Mesopotamia. So again, this is just a short list, but I felt it was appropriate to mention. Yeah. Is that a sample of the cuneiform text in the lower right hand? Right. Okay. And um, this is uh, what's called a Lamasu, and uh, that was a very common figure in the Sumerian um, inscriptions, uh, considered a guardian figure. So let's go forward and look at the content of Enoch. So some general principles, um, it's the most significant apocryphal work, and it's written and told in visions, dreams, and prophecies. 
Enoch is the most revered teacher and holy man of the Old Testament. He is one of three holy men to ascend to a heaven. Um, his encounters with God, angels, and their offspring uh, is the story of the pre-flood or the antediluvian creation. Um, describes the heavenly kingdom on earth, the count of the fallen angels, the Nephilim, and uh, the, their offspring. Um, it also uh, calls for a Messiah, describes the resurrection and the final judgment. So some of these concepts which are in, in embedded in Christian uh, beliefs uh, emerge in the Enochian text. It's a deeply influenced early Christian Gnostic beliefs and also brought forth calendar systems, geography, cosmology, astronomy, and even weather. So the table of contents of the first book of Enoch, and I do have a copy floating around here that if you wanted to take a look at, you can glance through and See what, see what you see. So the, the table of contents are the parable that goes right into the fall of the fall of the angels, the dream visions, Enoch's journey to the heavens, his uh, meeting with seven angels, the punishment of the fallen angels, the underworld, Jerusalem, and goes on from there. So let's take a look at some of this. In the general story, um, the rebel fallen angels are also called the watchers and there's a relationship to the temptation of eve and from this comes these hybrid humans called the nephilim and in the book of enoch and in the book of giants and in the book of jubilee they are considered um, not so friendly um, they're vampiric they uh, uh, take over creation they t they're taking over earth they're, they're, um, um, <laughs> they're bad, they're demonic, they, they want blood sacrifice, and um, so they're wrecking havoc on God's creation. And um, so to this end, well I think I can develop this, but we have the great flood, and then the destruction of the Nephilim, the imprisonment of the fallen angels, and then other another creation and a prophecy of a changing age and a savior to come. So those are some of the key ideas in this work. And we can um, exp expand that out a little bit. So one of the things in Enoch's uh, beginning is, is a description of the 10 heavens. And I just have a quick uh, quotation on the first three heavens. So the first heaven is just above the firmament where the angels control and watch. Um, in the second heaven, darkness is a, um, a prison of rebel angels. And in the third heaven is paradise, the Garden of Eden. So um, things are represented maybe in different ways in, than our uh, other text. Oh, I pressed a button. Um, this is a list of quotations um, from Enoch on the ten heavens. and. So the, the second heaven was, a, was turned into a, a place where the demons were held, uh, or the fallen angels were held as a punishment. The third heaven was represented again as the Garden of Eden. The fourth heaven was a place where the wheels of heaven were and rays of light differentiated the sun and the moon. The fifth heaven um, was a place of uh, where Grigori, um, again another kind of imprisonment where giants and their faces withered and their silence was perpetual. Um, the sixth heaven was a band of angels very bright and glorious who were constantly praising God. The seventh heaven um, was a dominion of governments, cherubim and seraphim who also were managing the business of the planet. And I saw the eighth heaven, which is called um, the changer of the seasons, and the ninth heaven, which was the heavenly home of the 12 signs of the zodiac, and the 10th heaven, the appearance of the Lord's face like iron made to glow in fire, and it brought out sparks and it burns. And so at one point, Enoch is allowed to go and see the face of God. 
in that tenth heaven, which burns like a fire that you can't even stand to look at. Um, one of the things that emerges with this description of the heavens and the angelic forces is this idea that in these different realms, these, these beings have um, control over it, They're, that they, they control the forces of nature, if you will, and they're, that, um, they're part of creation and, and they are, and, and this leads to ideas of magic and even of prayer, of calling, you know, these forces. Um, so here's some pictures of, of the idea of the ten heavens. This is from Milton. This is another view from Milton and a kind of an old painting, but so each of these swirling orbs is a different realm of heaven and uh, some were positive and some were negative. Um, along with the business of angels, um, the, here's some names and El means God, so Uriel is flame of God, um, Michael is who is like God, Raphael is God is, is a healer, Gabriel is strength of God. Japhiel is beauty of God, Ariel is lion of God, Azrael is um, angel of death. And then these are some of the names of the fallen angels which turn up Ramil, who was a morning god, Azaziel, who was strength of God, which then became kind of arrogant to God, and Gabriel, or Gadriel, wall of God. And so the rest of these I don't have translations for. Barakel, Ezekiel, Barakiel, and so on. So, this final screen on this piece uh, describes a quotation that says, These are the archangels who are above angels. They measure all life on heaven and earth. And the angels who are appointed over the seasons and the years, over the rivers and the seas, the fruits of the earth, every grass, giving food to all, to every living thing, and the angels who write all the souls of men and all their deeds before the Lord's face. So I'll leave you with that on that. But there's an image that was, again, represented. Um, so the foundation of that is very key in, in, in what's presented in this view that then is influencing the Old Testament and, and Christianity. So, so who was Enoch? Again, he was the first great patriarch. He was greater than Moses or Abraham. He walked with God. He was chosen by God. He was considered a messenger. He was one of the three greats, Enoch, Elijah, and Jesus. He ascended to heaven. He was the seventh in line after Adam. He was the son of Jared the father of Methuselah, the grandfather of Noah, and a witness before the flood. And he was said to have lived 365 years. Um, here's his family tree. So from Adam in the center here through, through Seth is Enoch, Methuselah, and then his uh, grandson was Lamech, the father of Noah. There's also a Lamech over here under Cain's line. So sometimes there's overlap about that. Um, Enoch was particularly uh, called upon by the angel Uriel. We used to have our friend Uriel who was here. Um, but he appeared to Enoch and taught him. And Uriel means east of God's throne and seen at dawn. And um, kind of like Lucifer was considered to be a, a, a dawn angel as well. So um, he showed Enoch the stars and planets, and he's the one who would take him up to, into heaven and showed him the powers of space. This is some Old uh, Testament references to Enoch. When Jared had lived 162 years, he begot Enoch. After the birth of Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and begot sons and daughters. So Jared was even more um, outstanding and long-lived. Uh, when Enoch had lived 65 years, he begot Methuselah. After the birth of Methuselah, Enoch walked, Enoch walked with God 300 years and he begot sons and daughters. All the days of Enoch came to 365 years 
Enoch walked with God, then he was no more, for God took him. So that's the reference of him being taken up. And in the, in the Sumerian text, there's descriptions of this, of a man being taken up, and it's rather interesting because in order to, for that to happen, he has to put on ear and be taken like it's being described in this, like he's riding in a spaceship. So, um, Enoch is mentioned in the um, rabbinical tradition as well. Um, he arrived from, I'm not going to kind of belabor that, but going forward with his ascension, um, his ascension is described in some of the same language um, as Elijah, that he was taken up in a chariot of fire. So it says in the book of um, Jasher, Enoch, um, ascended into heaven in a whirlwind with horses and chariots of fire. And in um, Cain's Elijah, uh, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into the heavens. So it's interesting how there's the same language, and you, you could even wonder, is it the same being, even though we do consider them to be two different beings, but there are different texts and, and that, uh, but that's very consistent, this idea of the chariots of fire, and that same language shows up in the, Sum in the Sumerian cuneiform. <clears throat> Again, it kind of almost makes you think of being in a spaceship. So let's take a look at the saga of the fallen angels a little more closely. And um, how do I go back? I, I wish maybe I can just escape and find it. Um, the screen I wanted to sh is a text from the Quran, actually. Oh, here we go. And um, it says that God commanded the angels to bow to man. And so God has made man his creation. And the angels are kind of in this other category where they're they're not the same. Um, you know, they're not they're not they're not gods and they're told to to uh, prostrate themselves so the angel, uh, to, to God's creation man. So it says the angels prostrated themselves, all of them except Iblis. He was proud and was one of the disbelievers. So that there was this group of angels from the onset. This was the first sin of the angels, that they were supposed to be in homage to God's creation. And they're, they're saying, what? <laughs> you know, we've been, we've been with you a lot longer, you know. We can do many more things than, than these creatures can. You want us to bow to them? So, so that was a problem. And, and that led to those angels being censored and having their privileges re revoked, if you will. So they were sent to the second heaven. Um, and um, like it's described in the second book, a very terrible place with all manner of tortures in which merciless angels torment those who dishonor God, who on earth practice sin against nature. And so what happened was they were, they were sent to um, the second heaven and they were given the job of being watchers. So again, from the Sumerian tablets, it sounds more like they're uh, working on a space station, you know, an outpost. They're, they're not uh, at home, you know, they're out in the hinterland. and. Um, so they're exiled, and in their exile, they're watching Earth, and, and so a group of them become um, lustful. They, they desire the women. And they group around um, one angel named Azazel, who um, organizes the angels into a pact, and they, and they, they say, okay, we're going to go down there, and we're going to do this, and we're going to agree to stand by each other. So they make a pact to go to Earth, and this this is the temptation of Eve, as referenced. And, and so it's a very different interpretation that it's emer you know it's coming from this group of um, 
uh, sinning angels, of, of disobedient angels, rather than some other plan. But um, then they, they come to earth and they, they seduce the women with, with knowledge. And, and uh, as described in the text, it's everything from conjuring arts and how to make uh, um, food or concoctions and, and how to make beautiful, you know, to make themselves beautiful with makeup and, and jewelry. We're still stuck with the problem of make stuff evil. Yes. That's the problem. That's why we haven't advanced. You know, we give us knowledge. So the women be married them and they begot hybrid humans. And there's, um, so these, these hybrid humans, though, are a problem. They're, um, Giants. They're they're not really humans anymore, and they're they're this strange race, and, and so this is a problem. And they, they they populate the earth and they take over the earth. They're they're bestial. They're uh, they're demanding blood sacrifice. They're vampiric, and they're demanding tributes. And 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 they're so powerful that they're taking over and becoming gods over these city states and such. And um, the humans cry out to God and ask for something to be done. And um, Enoch is, is, is part of this uh, milieu and it said that he went and hid. He went and became um, a hermit and, and hid in a cave to avoid what was happening and, and develop this relationship with God. Um, became inspired and the angel came to him. So, um, part, there's different versions at this point in the story. In, in one of the versions, the, the angels of, um, start to have dreams um, of their own demise and, and they, they go to, and by this time Enoch's also become represented as, as this human who is the best of God's creation and, and God's taking him up to heaven and, and that he's being a messenger for God and a representative to God. And so there are um, re recognizing um, that they're in trouble and they go to Enoch and ask him to intercede. And so Enoch goes to God at this point with the favor that he's gained. And um, um, I think if I read some of this text, it might help you. So 200 angels descended to Mount Hermon and divided into groups of 10 under a chief. They defiled themselves on mortal women, producing monstrous children. And some of them are described as 3,000 L's tall, which some people say would be 11,000 feet, but that's ridiculous. Um, with an L maybe a, a, just a portion of a, of a cubit. Um, the giants consumed the food from men, and so when Jared was a hundred, um, upon reaching the, Enoch lived alone in a cave to avoid the Nephilim, and announced their fates and punishment for their wickedness. So their offspring shall suffer the sins of the father. So, so this is where we get the judgment, and uh, the statement was made um, from God on high and he calls the flood. He also sets it up that the, the demons war with each other and so a lot of them are killed. Um, he can't kill the angels, the original angels. So he sends the flood to destroy the earth. And we know this story, we've all heard it. Um, and then he casts the original fallen angels into a pit of darkness until the final judgment day. So this is where we get um, the final judgment again, and we get lore of uh, places like Antarctica being where angels have been locked up, you know, the, the fallen angels have been locked up and, and held until the end of the days. Um, and, and then the flood is, is wipes out everything on earth, um, except for Noah who makes an ark. And so, um, so the book of Enoch is all <coughs> what we consider to be the first book of the Bible, Genesis, and but there's more detail about it. And certainly in the traditional Bible, we're not being told that there's giants and strange hybrids walking the planet. Um, so um, 
I want to mention a few other texts. I think I did already, but um, so there's the Enoch from the slot. This um, the Book of Giants is a text that is floating around in various traditions, and um, some of these other names: the Book of Noah, the Exaltation of Melchizedek, and offer more information about this this account that is is given a, a very short shift in the first few chapters of the Genesis and and so he was a huge part of our prehistory that you know we don't know that much about um, the book of the Jubilees is also one that has um, been compared to Enoch as having a lot of information and Another one is the book of Jasher, which is considered to be a history book. Oh, sure. And then um, one of the things that happens is that within the Old Testament, the book of Enoch is rejected. And it said it was rejected because it, it had prophecies of a Messiah to come. But even more so is that some of the values of the books of Enoch uh, were replaced by the views of Moses and um, things that, that Moses represented. So the, the second temple sacrifices, which in some ways were kind of like the sacrifices before the flood. Um, another thing that happened was uh, a transition from a solar calendar to a lunar calendar. With the with the second temple and the lunar calendar is in, inferior way of timekeeping. Um, it, it also had ideas of life after death and the idea of a final judgment. Um, so Judaism took a shift at some point with Moses away from um, even uh, engaging with that part of their history. Um, Enoch's Best themes continue to be evident in, in Western culture throughout, um, you know, the Middle Ages on. And the role of women in Enoch is kind of interesting. Um, there's a couple figures, uh, Ishtar, who is a, again kind of a Mesopotamian goddess. Um, Ishtar is interesting in this text here. It says that she tricked him into revealing the ineffable name of God, and she ascended, thereby escaping viol violation. So um, there's a very similar story of Isis in the um, Egyptian lore, that there's this period when Ra is becoming obsolete, and it's a transition from the reign of Ra to Isis and Osiris and Ra's dying and, and Isis says, I can help you, I can heal you, but you have to tell me your secret name. It won't work on this. And so she, he does, he tells her, and so then she becomes the preeminent deity. So it's a very similar story that this transition of the name and um, um, you know, it, it's the stuff of psychological research, psychological study. Uh, Lilith, the offspring of Adam and the she-devil, um, Lilith, was killed by Methuselah with his sword, which has the ineffable name of God etched on the blade. And so one of the things Methuselah did was cleaning up some of the giants, and so Lilith was considered um, part of this group, a female version a female uh, giant. There's another woman named Nama um, who has, uh, in different accounts, has, uh, is, is both hero and demon. So she was the daughter of Lamech from the Tubal Cain line. Um, Nama was the wife of Noah. Nama was a great beauty. Um, she was um, skilled with sweet sounds from cymbals. Nama was the opposite of Ishtar as she had union with the angel Shamdan and her offspring was Asmodeus, a demon. 
Um, in the Zohar, Nama is deceived and seduced. Uh, so, so she deceives and seduces um, the angels, not the reverse. In the, another version of the Zohar, she is a victim, or no, the angel is a victim of her beauty. And sometimes she is described as a, as a demon who wanders the darkness of the new moon looking for men. So the role of women in this saga is kind of variable. And here's some renditions again of, of Dante, by Dante, of, of the, the different uh, hells and heavens, Dante's Inferno. And so they were, his work was informed by this idea that we get from Enoch of the multiple heavens. And this particular image is, is um, this soul-eating creature at the center of hell. And William Blake, who um, was in the 16th, the 17th century, um, a master printer and deeply interested in mystical traditions, did a couple wood prints of Enoch. Here's one. Here's a human, tiny little human, and a creator. Here's also Enoch up in heaven with the angels and the wise ones. Um, we have this idea of Enochian magic from Aleister Crowley and John Dee. So um, John Dee in the 16th century was uh, a great librarian, one of the great minds uh, he consulted with Queen Elizabeth and her ministers on astrology and mathematics, and um, but he would uh, scry, which is a uh, and he was looking for wisdom, insight, and visions. He was trying to communicate with angels, and he teamed up with um, this fellow Kelly, who was more of a con artist seems who claimed to hear voices and was translating the visions that Kelly would get and um, he put them in inarticulate words and called it the language of angels he called it the Enochian language and um, I think John Dee was incredible as a scholar and, and esoteric but the work he did with this channeling, I think, was kind of dubious. And but it uh, remained an established tradition, and there was a lot of grimoires and a high interest in alchemy in this time period. And so uh, people studied it, and um, it sifted down into the 20th century with Aleister Crowley who looked at it, and then he formed his system of Enochian magic, building on what he got from not just John Dee and, and Edward Kelly, but he uses that terminology. And again, the idea of the universe is guided and guarded by these um, forces, angelic or demonic. The, um, the magician seeks to call them and control them. Another uh, tradition that comes through the Enochian work is the Tree of Life. It was, it was described in the third heaven. And so this is a Kabbalah principle also. And the three mother letters, the, the, the three spiritual elements the paths and the other letters. Again, I'm just kind of showing influences, not necessarily the whole tradition. Um, one of the things that, looking at this work by Enoch, it, it lends credibility to 
the business of myths, legends, lore, and fairy tales. W.B. Yeats um, and many Irish scholars have, have kept the lore and maintained that uh, little people and giants are real. Um, and it makes us ask, was there a time when, when strange beings lived among humans on Earth? Have we been hiding knowledge of these things? If so, why? Are they still among us? And this is a picture from the 20th century uh, of Tibet of a seven-foot Tibetan man. And my next slide are some more pictures of images of giants from the medieval era. But this is a said to be a mummified giant, again, from the turn of the 20th century in Ireland uh, that was found in a bog and then placed in a proper casket. I revisit that quote, their children grew to be giants of 3,000 L's. And if an L is 1 18th of a cubit, that would be uh, 166 cubits or 200 feet tall, which is still pretty tall. Um, but maybe an L is even smaller than 1 18th of a cubit. And some other um, mystical things from Enoch is the Key of Solomon or Clavicle of Solomon in Latin. This is a text called the Clavicle of Solomon that's in the British Museum and um, was said to be written by Ptolemy the Greek, so it probably goes back to somewhere around the first century. And it has these very uh, familiar symbols for anyone who's been studying esoteric practices. And it, uh, this book talks about in, invoking the angel, angel angelic beings and calling on forces as well and um, so the last thing I wanted to talk about was Enoch in the cuneiform text and um, this little image here gives you some of the key places Persia um, Akkad Sumer Babylon and so tens of thousands of clay tablets have been stored in museums in London, Berlin, Iraq, Iran, and Israel. And many have only been translated in the 20th century. Um, they record a similar description of creation and this battle between this uh, sort of dominating creatures on the planet at one time and a flood that was sent to destroy them. And um, along with that, many of these tablets have yet to be translated. But um, so when we look at just what's out there, for some reason it's going backwards. Some of the key collections of, um, are at the Iraq Museum, the Syrian Museum, the British Museum has 30,000 tablets, Pennsylvania. Um, probably um, what I find to be interesting is, is that th this is finite. You know, there's so many here, there's so many there, and that, um, you know, that there is a bottom to it. <laughs> you know, and that part of what's emerging is starting to cross-reference these traditions. And um, th this picture here is kind of interesting. It's showing the, the, the stylus that's used to create these cuneiform uh, words. And this is the language that precedes what we, we have now. I mean, this precedes the hieroglyphics. It's incredibly sophisticated. So this is an example of a cuneiform tablet on the bottom. And then this is a, an inscription on a wall or a stone, you know, monument. And I think that's the Behustin one. The Behustin, yeah. And um, this is another version of the Behustin inscription, which is in Iraq. Mm. And this is a list of places where there are more than 10,000 cuneiform tablets. I found that to be incredibly interesting. So Istanbul, British Museum, 
Cornell University, the Louvre, the National Museum of Baghdad, University of Pennsylvania, and Yale. So we have quite a few in the United States. And um, this Behustin tablet's significant. And there's King Darius there. Is is considered the um, Rosetta Stone for cuneiform, and it was written in three languages, and was able to be cross-referenced, and, and was the thing that helped break through in the last century getting cuneiform translated. But it was King Darius bragging about how when his father, Cyrus the Great, died, in order to secure his kingdom, he had to fight off 19 um, rebellions in one year, and he whomped them all. <laughs> so, um, but continue, uh, here are some other libraries, the Ashmolean in Oxford, again, P Pennsylvania, uh, Germany, the Manchester, Syria, Syria, University of Chicago, the Oriental Institute. And I was just there a month, last month, and that was amazing. The Spurlock, and then this is places with a hundred tablets. But again, here's Darius's tablet, and if you you can see, here's Darius uh, claiming his uh, sovereignty, and these are all the people that he wiped, you know, he overcame. And then these are these inscriptions in this stone on this mountain in Iraq, and they're still there. So that led to our being able to translate cuneiform. Um, again, here's some types of periods. Uh, the Sumerian Endu, the, the Sumerian King's Looks, the Sharuk, the Atra Hasis, the Epic of Gilgamesh, and the Berusa, some primary uh, large finds. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Epic of Gilgamesh. I guess we can go back to that. Which is um, a beautifully written account, or else perhaps beautifully translated. And um, Gilgamesh is, is a king of Uruk, and he's a young king, and he's uh, two thirds God and one and one third human, or two three fifths rather. And he because he's three fifths, and I, I, I forget if it was because it came from his mother or his father, he can't he's not immortal. So he's a demigod, he, he's like Hercules or Helen of Troy, but he can't um, he can't live forever. And he's he's quite a super guy. He loves to fight and cavort and he pretty much wears everyone out, and, and they, they call the gods to help him. So the gods send him a play fellow who is kind of a super beast preacher named Enkidu, and they become, they have a big fight, and, and then they become best friends. And so they go on these great quests. Um, one of the quests they go is to the cedar forest, and they kill a demon, and they make the world better for all to live. And they cut a giant tree and give it to the god Enlil. Um, meanwhile, the goddess Ishtar, who's the granddaughter of the gods, the, grand, the granddaughter, um, she's like Venus. She's very lusty, and she, she wants Gilgamesh, and he rejects her because many of her lovers end up dead. It's just the way it is. So he's not going to risk that. And so she's mad, and she sends the bull of heaven, which is kind of like this creature, um, to punish Uruk. And Gilgamesh and, and Enkidu are such heroes, they, they vanquish the bull of heaven, and they kill the bull of heaven, which is a very bad thing, because the bull of heaven is the um, consort of the queen of the underworld. And um, so this creates some problems for Gilgamesh. And um, so Ishtar takes revenge and kills Enkidu. And now for the first time, this young prince king, who's pretty much been able to have his way, knows, knows real suffering. He's lost his dear friend. 
And so he goes on a quest, um, and at first he wants to seek immortality. It's by gosh, it's his birthright, he should have that. So he's, he goes to the, the place to find the gods, Mount Mashu, and to the underworld. And, and he gets help from um, an innkeeper named Siduri, and the ferryman named Urshnabi. And they lead him to Noah, who is a different name. Um, who Noah is, is, is living as an immortal in, in one of the heavens and past the other world. And Noah tests him and he finds that <coughs> Gilgamesh is, is, is a brave but egotistical hero and he, he doesn't, he, he, he fails the test. So he's denied immortality, but in mercy, um, Noah's wife tells him about the elixir of youth and he can get it from the bottom of the sea. So he goes on another journey, he goes to the bottom of the sea, and uh, finds this elixir, and is on his way home, and a snake sneaks up and steals it from him. So once again, his hopes are dashed. And, and so at, at this point, he's, he's, he's kind of surrendering, he gives in, you know, he accepts his fate that he, he's, a, he's a moral person. And he returns home, and it, it ends with him with the, singing the praises of his home and accepting his humanity. So it's kind of the moral. The moral of the story is to you know count your blessings and accept your you know your, your world. And and it reminds me of the Wizard of Oz because you know Dorothy goes home and there's no place like home, and um, she has a greater appreciation for Kansas. So this is a, a picture of. Gilgamesh and Enkidu slaying the bull of heaven. And there's a lot of images of that. But this story, it plays into, it's the afterworld of the flood. It's the afterworld of, of, this, of, of what was known and this new period of creation. And, it, and it's saying, you know, accept your status, accept your state you know, as, as a message for, for humanity, for the human race. Um, one of the um, <laughs> important people in, in working with these texts, uh, these cuneiform texts, has been um, Zachariah Sitchin. And I pictured about five, six of his books down here, seven. And he uh, is here holding one of a, a Sumerian tablet. And he died not too many years ago, but in the 70s, he came forth with his first book called The Twelfth Planet. And he was living in Germany and had access to the tablets that were in the Germany or Austrian Museum. And so he's, he would go and, and, and get these texts. That, I mean, there were printed versions of them. And um, so he started translating them. And, and um, I had the great fortune to study with him, and I was certified to teach his material. And um, he was an incredible linguist. Um, he, he knew Aramaic, Coptic, Hebrew, you know, and six different versions of Hebrew, and then the different Sumerian um, languages. And, and he, spent, he said he spent 10, 20 years on the first book. And he worked as a journalist, and he's a, he's a good writer. Um, but it took him 12 years or, of research to, to get this book written. And he said it started out when he was a young boy, and he was in Hebrew class, and, and they're saying Shem meant glory. And, and he's saying, no, Shem means tower. And they were talking about the text for the building of the Tower of Babel, and that, um, that it wasn't. Um, glory it was rocket that they were building a tower for a rocket and he was reading it as that they were making technology you know wasn't this airy fairy you know we're doing it for the glory of God no we're doing it to build a rocket to go into to heaven you know to go into the sky and so then so then he had this whole different read but what he found with with the cuneiform text is that it's the same material that's in the Bible it's just, it's the Bible is, is inheriting the text from Sumeria and Babylon. And that there are differences in, in different uh, translations, and there's different versions of some of the same text over and over, just as we just saw with Enoch, there's like 
Jubilee and Giants and Barak and Ezra and Maccabee, you know, they're variations. So, so that's what becomes challenging is cross-referencing. But um, what Zachariah Sitchin found, and I'll give you it in a nutshell, is that um, that first of all, the Sumerian Babylon tablets are much older sources. That they were translated. His work, he started translating in the 50s through through. Um, actually, he was translating up until 2010 when he died. Um, and that there's a divine trinity, and it's a father, Anu, and there are two sons, Enki and Enlil. And Enki is the engineer and the good guy, the lovable one, who, who, who was involved in genetically engineering the human race. And Enlil's the commander, the military guy, the one who says no. And Enki's the one who says yes. And that these two brothers were given dominion over certain parts of, of this creation of Earth, and that they're feuding and fighting. And even the story of the fallen angels may really be a, a way of the winner to say, you're the bad guy. And, and um, usually Enki's associated with the trident and the fork. And, um, and, and I have also represented Anu as Brahma, Enki as um, Shiva, and Enlil as Vishnu, you know, in the Hindu tradition. But they also have a sister who would be Isis or Athena or Mary, and a granddaughter.